So yeah, once again, uh, officially, um, welcome everyone um, to this uh, grant writing workshop held by the Business History Conference, uh, more specifically the um, Emerging Scholars Committee at the Business History Conference. Uh, I'm Gassan Moazin, a co-chair of the Emerging Scholars Committee, and um, I'm also joined by my uh, fellow co-chair, Beatriz Rodriguez Satizaba. Um, so um, today we're very glad to, that we have two great speakers for this um, workshop on grant writing. So um, the speakers are Professor Christina Lubinsky and Professor uh, Ed um, Bolesen. And um, they are both going to talk to us um, about um, um, about grant writing, and then we'll have some time for question and answers and um, and um, uh, uh, yeah, and and interaction between the speakers and um, everyone here. Um, I'll just briefly say so. Christina um, will, and and I think Ed as well, uh, obviously will be known to uh, many here. But uh, Christina is professor of business history at Copenhagen Business School. Has published very widely on um, all kinds of facets of business history. Um, many journal articles, edited volumes, and also um, books. And her most recent book is Navigating Nationalism in Global Enterprise, which came out with Cambridge in two thousand twenty-two. Um, and Ed Boleisen is Professor of History and Public Policy and Vice Provost of Interdisciplinary Studies at Duke University. Um, he has published um, several, um, several books, edited volumes and um, um, collections. And his most recent book is Fraud in American History from Barnum to Madoff, which came out with Princeton um, in 2017. But I think I shouldn't take up any, uh, any more time. So um, Christine and Ed, if you want to take it from here, please uh, feel free to do so. Thanks, yeah, Hassan. Thank uh, so I just maybe just start with a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, so we'd like, if you could, to put your institutional affiliation and title in the chat, uh, just so everybody knows who's uh, who's joined today. Uh, at, feel free to throw questions into the chat as well at any time. Um, we're uh, we're going to provide a broad overview. Uh, in the first 20, 25 minutes, um, and then leave lots of time for questions and discussion. But if you want to ask a question before that, please don't hesitate to do so. And here's here's the basic outline. So we're going to just briefly mention uh, the, the sort of overview of the kinds of fellowships that exist in Europe and North America, spend a little bit more time on uh, an overview of grants in Europe that are available in, in Europe and North America, um, say a word or two about each of our own experience with fellowships and grants, and then uh, and then offer some tips. Uh, but we want to have most of the time be available for Q&A. Um, and I would love it if it's possible, if you could put on your camera, because I think it's so nice if we can see your expressions and faces. And of course, feel free to vehemently shake your head or nod or whatever it is that you have in nonverbal expressions. And then while we speak, the other one will always monitor the chat so that we can also pick up your questions from the chat if you have any. So feel free to make this interactive, which is always nicer. And of course, if we're saying something that is widely out of your experience or you want to hear something else, then just stop us, wave at me and say, Christina, shut up. I have other questions because we want to make this primarily about you because that's the most important part of this group. It's nice to see so many familiar faces too. Hello, hello. Good. Should we then add, do you want to get started or would well, you? What, what, why, don't, why don't you start, Christina? We can just kind of go ping pong back and forth. Okay, perfect. So, fe so fellowships in Europe. Fellowships in Europe. So uh, Europe is a difficult place because it's so diverse. And I also don't, we don't want to suggest that Europe and the US are the centers of academic work. There's lots of other places in the world that are doing much more interesting and uh, exciting uh, work. These are the two places that we know the best. And I will say that a lot of the fellowships and grants in Europe are very open to people from other parts around the world. So oftentimes there is an opportunity for you to apply either to come to Europe or to collaborate with European universities, libraries, institutions. And so that's why we thought it might be helpful to talk about that a little bit. Europe is difficult in that sense because it's so country specific and oftentimes has also specific language requirements, although that is changing a little bit and in many places you get very far with English these days. I think uh, universities, libraries and foundations are probably the most important places for looking towards fellowships in Europe. And I have a couple of places where I personally look 
and that I share with my PhDs and postdocs when I'm interested in what's new and what's popping up. So I warmly recommend the EBHA newsletter. That's the European Business History Association, EBHA. I put that in the chat as well, and I can dig up the link as well so that you can find that more easily. They send a regular newsletter and they announce a lot of fellowships, even those that are not offered every year. And so there's a good access to opportunities in the business history community through that newsletter. Uh, HNET is represented in many of the countries in Europe and has regularly updates as well. You can uh, sign up for them as a digest. So they send you information once a week or once a month or every day, depending on how regular you want that. And they have good ideas for how to apply for positions and, and not just positions, but fellowships in the European context as well. In the German context, which is where I'm originally from, it's called Hasotz Okult. So those of you that are interested in Germany should feel free to check that out. LinkedIn, of course, is a big source of information and Paula de la Cruz is always doing an amazing job of uh, promoting different types of fellowships through LinkedIn. And then I'm personally employed by the Center for Business History at Copenhagen Business School. And we also try and uh, communicate this type of information. We are also open to visiting fellows if ever you feel inclined to do that. One last thing I want to mention, because it's a bit different in Europe than it is in the US, at least from my experience, we had, especially in the last five to 10 years, a host of postdoctoral positions, which in the European context doesn't mean one year after your PhD to finish the book, but it's rather a longer time period for a fellowship, typically one to three years. And they're structured much more like fellowships as well. So they give you a ton of time to do your own research, to go to libraries and archives and things like that. And so I warmly recommend those. Uh, we are just hiring for postdocs in business history. We just finished a round. There is another round coming next year. And if that's something that's interesting to you, then you can definitely let me know. And I'm happy to share that information. But there's also a ton of other universities that are regularly promoting these postdocs, often related to grants that we talk about in a little bit. And they are a really good opportunity for kind of getting a foot in the door and building a good network. Um, yeah, that's my quick Brush stroke overview of fellowships, but feel free to ask questions in the chat or otherwise if you if you want to know more. Ed, your turn. Thanks, Christina. So a, lo a lot of uh, what Christina mentioned is relevant for North America as well, things like HNET, LinkedIn. Uh, in the US, there are a small number of fellowships that specifically target business history at the Harvard Business School, at the Hagley Library, uh, on the new great opportunity through the BHC itself with the Kaufman Fellowships. Um, much larger number of fellowships available broadly to humanists or social scientists. Um, so uh, that th those are available, for example, through the National Endowment for Humanities, through the American Council of Learned Societies, National Humanities Center, uh, often uh, there are opportunities for visiting fellowships to centers or institutes at research universities, similar to what Christina described in, in Europe. Um, so, so those are some of the you know, really uh, uh, crucial um, opportunities. And then, of course, there are lots of internal university fellowships as well, uh, often more uh, targeted to the faculty. But there are some popping up, especially with concerns about the academic job market for uh graduate students who are finishing up uh, to provide them with often a little bit of teaching, but but also space to continue uh, work on research. So Christina, back to you for grants in Europe. Maybe are there any questions about the fellowships before we move on to grants? Yes, there is one from Nicole Taylor. Yes, Nicole, someone from Canada, would you be able to write those in the chat or send a follow-up? Um, I'm actually not from Canada, uh, but there are a lot of opportunities in Canada as well. So, for example, the Canadian uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council is a major one. That's the that's the the core uh, public opportunity, the government funded opportunity. Um, but uh, you know, it, there's a similar uh, set of opportunities sometimes from foundations or uh, or, or again, the, the universities in Canada, the University of Toronto, uh, University of British Columbia often have uh, uh, fellowship opportunities as well. Okay, perfect. 
And no worries for those of you that have unstable internet connections and are eating breakfast. Hope you enjoy. It's a <laughs> that's not a that's not a problem at all. So uh, maybe a bit about grants, and I think Ed and I will talk a little bit more about what to watch out for when you're applying for grants. But just for a brief overview of the European scene, we have each country basically has a national research foundation. So there's a German Research Foundation and a Danish Research Foundation and so on and so forth. And they have on their website information about these smaller and larger grants. Often they are interdisciplinary and require some sort of collaboration between people. But there's also a few for especially emerging scholars coming out of the PhD, going through the postdoc and recently tenured people. So that's an interesting thing to look at. I think what's quite unique about uh, the European scene is how much money is available from private foundations. And that's political foundations related to political affiliations, but also a lot of business foundations. So especially in Northern Europe and Central Europe, there's a ton of different business foundations uh, that trying to make up for the fact that they became filthy rich by giving some money back to research and uh, having usually a pretty nice setup for smaller and larger grants. And then, of course, the holy grail within the European scene is the European Union Horizon 2020 and now 2024 program. Those are incredibly competitive grants. They are very formalistic as well. The applications are very complicated, but I'm happy to talk through those too. I think the Marie Curie Fellowship is one of the most prominent ones for recent PhDs and postdocs. And that's a really nice opportunity and can, you can apply for that just as a single person. The ERC GANs at the European Research Council grants tend to be larger, so more money available for a number of different things, but also much more competitive and more difficult to get to. The good news is pretty much all countries in Europe by now have very professional support structures for applying for ERC grants because they want to encourage people to do more of these applications. And so there's a ton of people available attached to the universities and to the national governments that will help you polish your applications to the ERC. That's not to say that it's not difficult, it's still difficult and maybe something for a bit later in the career, but it is a very nice opportunity in the European context. So, so in North America, uh, it's a similar structure. They're, they're government channels, uh, uh, public agencies. So in the US, again, the National Endowment for the Humanities for business historians, uh, a lot of opportunities at the National Science Foundation. In Canada, it would be, again, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council as the major government funder. Lots and lots of foundations uh, to, to explore. Often uh, there will be public calls, but often there won't. And so uh, being willing to, uh, it really helps if you have uh, foundation relations staff at your university to get work with and try and identify places that might be uh, helpful uh, to you in, in uh, exploring potential grant opportunities. Uh, there are also a lot of internal university opportunities for, for grants, uh, particularly C grants, but sometimes increasingly larger scale collaborative grants as well. As in Europe, these are much more likely to be interdisciplinary opportunities, lots more money on offer than with fellowships, expectation of a longer time frame, expectation of significant collaboration, not only with other scholars, but sometimes with other partners beyond uh, the university. Uh, uh, increasingly expectations about uh, participation of students as well as, as peers. Uh, these are much more complicated to develop as Christina uh, suggested. And we're gonna uh, first just give you a, a bit of a sense of our own personal experience with, with these, uh, these endeavors. And then we'll get into some tips before opening it up for wider conversation. So that's just, you know, really, really broad stroke, big picture overview. But please feel free to follow up if there's any questions along the way. Ed and I thought it might be helpful for us to say what kind of grants we have ourselves applied for and got granted, just so that you have a better understanding of what we know the most about and what where you can tap us for experience. I would also encourage all of you to make use of the BHC. I've experienced the BHC as an incredibly helpful and supportive community. And if you know anyone who has applied for a grant that you're also interested in, I would definitely reach out to them and, and ask them for advice, maybe sharing applications and so on and so forth. So when I say this is the grants I have received, please don't take it as a showing off. 
it's more to give you an idea of the experience and what I can speak to with the most competence. And then there's probably other things that I don't know as much about and where other people in the room can help better. So I have uh, started my career in Germany and for my doctoral dissertation, I had two fellowships, one from the German Research Foundation, that's a national foundation, and the other from a private business foundation, the Gerda Henkel Foundation. Those are the people that make glue and, uh, and uh, laundry detergents and things like that. And they were to fund my dissertation research. And so there were no other people involved. There was also very limited travel money related to that. It was primarily my own salary. And then after the PhD, I applied for the Newcomen Fellowship at Harvard Business School, which is, of course, a classic of the business history community. Lots of people at the BHC have been for one year at Harvard Business School working with Geoffrey Jones and Walter Friedman. And so that's another fellowship that I can tell you a little bit more about if you're interested in that. And then here in Europe, I've been involved in a Marie Curie Fellowship. So that's European research money uh, for a postdoctoral position. And then recently, meaning last year, I got granted a, a big project by the Carlsberg Foundation. Those are the beer brewers in Denmark. And they uh, established for us a research environment with five PhDs and four postdocs. So we're also actively hiring at Copenhagen Business School in these areas. And you can find those jobs always on our website. But I can talk a little bit more about that Carlsberg Foundation grant, which was one of those larger interdisciplinary grants. And we have made a very conscious decision in our team that we wanted to be super transparent about that application. So we actually posted our entire application online. And I've just put the link in the chat. If you're interested in it, feel free to check it out. I've disabled the links there because I didn't want to make it easy for people to reach out to our partners, but you get a good big picture overview of what such a grant application entails. I will say, as far as grant applications go, this one was actually a relatively minor time investment considering how much we got out of it. So it was a very nice experience and the foundation is very supportive and has been very good to work with. So that's a little bit about my experience and I'm happy to answer any questions that come up around these things. So for me, uh, uh, similarly, the first thing I'll say is that uh, the list I'm about to offer quickly is not the list of what I've applied for. It's the list of what I've received. So uh, lots of rejections in the mix as well. Um, these this this world is one that's competitive, and uh, it's it's good to have a, a a thick skin, and and to be willing to uh, to to keep going even when you get uh, some no's because you will get them. So on the fellowship side, I've received an American Council for Learned Societies fellowship, which I took to the National Humanities Center, which is just down the road from Duke in the Research Triangle in North Carolina. Uh, I've received a, a fellowship also from HBS, but for the for not for the newcomer, but for for already uh, for faculty already uh, situated in a uh, in a university, and a, another fellowship from an organization called the Tobin Project. Uh, which does interdisciplinary work uh, around public policy issues. Uh, have larger collaborative research grants from uh, a couple of American foundations that are not likely ones that you are familiar with, the Smith Richardson Foundation and the Gilman Foundation, both of which are focused on issues of public policy. So uh, those connections in the projects that I was part of were crucial there. One was uh, a pro both of them actually were related to regulatory governance as a as a as a topic area and involved pulling together uh, uh, interdisciplinary so uh, group of social scientists interested in, in regulatory uh, uh, policy. Also, have uh, received some big institutional grants. So this is I've been PI or co PI on grants that were not to me as a scholar, but to Duke for institutional purposes. One from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, next Generation uh, uh, PhD Education Grant, and also uh, a $3 million grant from the Mellon Foundation called Humanities Unbounded uh, that has supported all kinds of things at Duke. Uh, the other thing is, I'm as, in my position as Vice Provost, um, I inter oversee a variety of internal interdisciplinary co grant competitions. Uh, this is uh, 3 to $4 million a year that are going to uh, faculty across our campus. Uh, most target interdisciplinary groups, uh, some target schools and departments. So I've, I've got a lot of experience on the other side of the table as well in terms of selection. Um, so some tips. I think this is really the, the core of what you're, you're interested in and that we want to spend most of the rest of the hour talking about. Um, 
the first, it may seem obvious, before you really even decide to explore whether you want to apply for a fellowship or a grant, please read the parameters carefully. If, if it doesn't fit what you're trying to do, it's probably not worth your time to try and apply for the opportunity. And, and with grants, those, those parameters often are, as Christina already mentioned, extensive. There, there may not just be an area that is described, but a whole set of expectations about what you should be doing in structuring your activities, the kinds of outputs that are expected, the kind of reporting that you will be need, need to be equipped to do. Um, so, so the parameters matter, and you may want to reach out to program officers wherever you can to get some details there. With respect to some foundation opportunities, there may not be something that's posted where there's an official competition. It actually may be having to figure out how to develop a relationship with a program officer to figure out whether your interests align with where the foundation wishes to consider uh, proposals. It can be quite murky, actually, in the foundation world. Sometimes it's, it's clear as with government funding, sometimes it's not. Yeah, definitely agree with that. Ed, uh, there was also a question in the chat if you were willing to share your grants with people, just to name. Uh, yes, I can. What I can do is um, uh, also to maybe provide a compliment. I can. I'll, I will get you a report on the outcome of a grant, <laughs> which might be a which might be a good compliment to what Christina shared. Perfect. And then maybe a little bit looking at when you are applying, how to make the best argument for yourself. Uh, this is just my experience and my two cents it may not apply to every situation so take it with a grain of salt but i always found that uh, one of the things that really mattered to foundations is often managing their risk and so they're very interested in everything that signals to them that you're very likely to succeed with the plan that you're outlying so they're not necessarily looking for the most outrageous provocative <laughs> forward looking thing but maybe also for things that where they feel like there's a good chance that you get this done and one thing that i found really helpful in that respect was working with partners both academic partners and also partners from industry and from the civil society around us because it's often a small ask to reach out to someone who's an expert on your field and say i'm thinking about applying for this grant and i would love your support would you write me a short letter or in my case, I actually wrote that letter for people and said, would you mind emailing that back to me? And then that signals to the foundation that I have actually reached out and had conversations with people about this topic and that they would also support the overall development of the grant going forward. So I found that helpful first for the foundation to signal to them that I have carefully thought about how to responsibly use their money, but also for myself because it often helped clarify the thought. I think the other thing that I find extremely important with these grants is that you write it and then you discuss it and have people read it and edit it because it's often very, very limited space to make a big argument. And the most important thing in these grant applications is often the abstract that needs a really strong hook. It needs to be a reason for doing this particular project, not just the research hasn't been great in this area or there should be more work done on this geography or something like that, but an actual motivation, a driving force so that it's believable that this is something that you would successfully complete. And I think that could be really helpful for an application in that space. So, so let me uh, throw in a couple of other, I, I think, key, key tips. One is uh, you should be aware of how competitive the opportunity is. That doesn't mean you shouldn't make the effort, even if it's highly competitive, but you might want to think about whether going through the process of developing the grant proposal will be valuable regardless of whether or not you receive the grant by clarifying as, as Christina suggested and by engaging with others to refine the ideas. Also, whether you think there's a good chance you'd be able to reuse elements of, of the grant proposal in other opportunities that you know about. Um, Wherever possible, it's great to get clarification ahead of time from program officers, mentioned that a little bit already. Uh, it's also really important to know the audience. For either fellowships or grants, there typically is a two-phase process. And often that involves an initial phase where you are going to be assessed in essence at like a form of peer review and where there's more likely to be attention from experts close to your area. 
And then a second phase where those who've done well in that phase are assessed by a broader group who know less about the details of not just your subfield, but potentially your discipline. And so there's this challenge to be able to meet the needs of both audiences so that you can demonstrate you have chops for the expert and that you're legible to the non the person who is, is expert in some things, but not in close to the areas necessarily that you are expert in. Um, so avoiding jargon is really a good idea as one example of that. Uh, with grants, it's also often... And this gets to the point that Christina raised about uh, plausibility. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you should be proposing to do something that's narrow and not that ambitious, but people are going to be looking for evidence that you can pull off what you are saying you can pull off. As a, so that might mean, if especially if it's a collaborative endeavor, that you can show you've worked with the people before, uh, that you have some pilot data. That, that in essence, you know what you're talking about and that your plan resonates. A um, few really quick points on after we after you get a grant, and then we'll open it up just for, for, for questions. Um, the more complex the ambition, the more important you need, the more important it is for you to pay attention to project management. This is not something that we tend to uh, focus on in, in PhD education. Large grants really require it. And that's not to say the PI can't be the project manager, but often it's helpful to have someone else, a PhD student, a postdoc, a staff member, depending on the circumstances, who can take on that role of just keeping things going and keeping them organized. Uh, any collaborative grant is not going to work if there isn't a good team ethos. There isn't clarity about roles, if people don't know each other, if they don't actually like working together. Uh, so team building really requires attention. And then finally, it, it's just helpful to, to, be a, to be mindful of the reporting you're going to be responsible for. A lot easier to report if you're paying attention to that as you go and you're thinking about what it is that you need to uh, collect about your own activity than if you try and just throw it together under a deadline at the end of the green. Christina, yeah, any I other thoughts or do you want to just open it up? No, I just wanted to say I totally agree with that. And I think I personally have underestimated that many times over. And I think it is a good ask for yourself time to clarify, is that actually the type of work I want to do in the next few years, right? Because we all assume that applying for grants and getting these grants is the ultimate success in this field. And there is an element of like showing that you can do this is important to an academic career. But also if you're applying for these large grants that need a lot of management, it means your time gets allocated much more to HR questions, project management, team building efforts, these sort of things than necessarily to your own individual research. And so it needs to fit where you are in your career and what your next steps are as well. So that's it's worth considering before applying for these very large, large grants. I think that's uh, I, I also have made the experience that there's always this double audience. And so being able to speak to an audience of possibly biologists and physicists, even though your project is deeply historical, is a learned skill and really takes time. And in particular, it takes other people to read your thoughts and work with you and making yourself very legible to an audience that has never heard about your topic necessarily. So I think that's also a really important part. So I think we should open up for, for your questions if you have any, and then you know, happy to dive deeper into any of the individual points that, that were raised. Does anyone have a, a thought, a reflection? Is there anything you would like to apply for in the next year or so? Yeah, Kina. Hello, uh, Ed and uh, Christina. Thank you so much for this. I, I learned a lot. I really appreciate it. My question is really about the imagined audience. It's like uh, when you are writing the grants, who are your imagined audience? Like maybe like a, a college educated person or more like, you know, someone in your field or, you know, it's kind of how to balance the kind of specific audience and the more kind of a general, uh, like a college educated people who might be really interested in the topic you are, you know, uh, proposing. Thank you so much. So it, it depends on the opportunity. If you're applying for the Kaufman Fellowship through, B through the BHC, 
you're only going to be evaluated by business historians. That's it. Full stop. If you're applying for a fellowship at, say, the National Humanities Center in the United States, which is open to anyone all over the world, uh, you're going to be evaluated initially by three people who are close to your field of expertise, who are former fellows of the National Humanities Center. So that's at this point, you know, close to a thousand people that they choose from. And, and then you're going to be uh, scrutinized by a selection committee who are not just college ed educated people, they're, they're, they're humanists, they're scholars, but you could have a classical archeologist or a literature professor or someone whose focus is on religion uh, in the mix. So by, the, by contrast, let's say you're going for one of the uh, massive center grants that are available in the United States from the National Science Foundation, or uh, you know, MacArthur had a million dollar grant opportunity, uh, a hundred, sorry, a hundred million dollar grant opportunity uh, some years ago. There, they're going to be at a similar level of peer review, but then you're going to be looking not only at a, a, a second level of academic kind of or expert uh, 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 review, but a selection committee that in the NSF's case, the National Science Foundation's case, will be their program officers and leadership. And there will be all kinds of other lenses that are that are at play there, including uh, uh, geographic distribution and I mean, a whole set of other considerations that are that are complicated beyond the ones that uh, are in the smaller dollar amount uh, or euro amount contexts. So you need to know if you can, if you need to find out how that's all going to work. If you're just applying to one of these foundations that does this a little opaque, the truth is they're what the audience is a single program officer. That's who you have to impress. Now there still may then be a check by the foundation board of some kind, but typically that's not a very strong check. So it's literally one person that you have to convince in some cases. So, so until you know the, um, the situation, it's, it's hard to answer that question. It's impossible to answer that question just one way. I will say in general, it, it never hurts you to say, am I answering the so what question? Why should, why should anyone care about this in a way that is broadly intelligible, not just to specialists, but to people who are smart and not specialists? You never go wrong doing that. No, <laughs> that always helps. I do think it's really good advice to investigate what the evaluation process is like, because evaluation can also mean evaluation based only on a written submission or a written submission plus an interview or a written submission to different audiences. And to just know that ahead of time might help with that decision. I think the other challenge that we as business historians often have and that is manageable is that we're often between disciplines, right? So we're a little bit history and a little bit business. Like, like this, my situation, maybe for you, it's a little bit different, but some have a little bit history and a little bit sociology or something like that. I think it's important for grants to be very clear who your peers are, because they will evaluate you first in like a peer review situation. And just like with journal submissions, if you are not clear who your peers are, then it's going to go to different peer groups and it's difficult to kind of find supportive audiences in, in these very different environments. So I think to be very specific about who you consider your peer and why you think these people are relevant for your project is important. But then I totally agree with that. I think any proposal gets better if you answer afterwards the so what question for someone who has nothing to do with your field. Why would anyone care outside of your narrowly defined specialization in a sense? And I think that only makes proposals stronger and oftentimes for me, I need help with that. I need other people to tell me what they find interesting about it and why that matters to this societal question or this particular challenge. And so I like the dialogue around that to help me surface some of these interesting points. So that's interesting is a good reaction from any person at a foundation or, or a grant giver. There's a question in the chat, Christina. Yes. So I will, let me just uh, pull that down. So I, I will read it uh, or at least summarize it. 
Yeah. So, uh, so this is a, this is a more focused question. Uh, this is a, an individual. This is a, a, my, uh, I hope I get the pronunciation close to right. Uh, Pallavi Singh. Um, and uh, Pallavi is interested in working on India focused projects in the uh, but at a UK in, in, uh, university, some preliminary works in place, has academic propose a support and a proposal. Um, but concerned about whether, and this is about the parameters question, uh, uh, whether a, a, a research on India is a good fit for something like the Marie Curie fellowships. This is clearly a question for you. Um, and it's, of course, related to larger uh, themes. So it's a case study. Uh, and that, that is how informal institutions continue to shape modern economies. That's actually a topic that I'm very interested in myself. Yeah. Um, so, so then, uh, if you think about a person situated there with a topic that's not in the in the uh, society where the research is being done, at least, uh, or where the person is based in an academic institution, what are the options? Yeah, I think, Pallavi, you're right on the money. I think uh, the way you frame it makes perfect sense for Marie Curie. And I would even go as far and say that you, if your project is only focused on the UK, you have basically no chance of getting a Marie Curie fellowship or any EIC uh, funding. I think it's important that your empirical setting is sort of interesting and different and not the classic environment. So I think that works to your advantage. And if you frame it the way you frame it here in the chat very briefly as an example of a larger question, and you show maybe oftentimes the Marie Curies are structured in work packages. So it could be that of your three or four work packages, two are so solely focused on India and one might be a bit more comparative and maybe one is theoretical or conceptual, I think then you are very well set to apply for a Marie Curie Fellowship if that's what you want to do. And uh, the UK is eligible for that at the moment, so that's definitely an option. Again, I think it makes more sense potentially with good partners and showing how your results would also be used within the EU. That can be a, an argument that can help you, but I think it's it's a good setup. I hope that was more or less a question from the summary. So, so we're, while we're waiting for um, other uh, other questions to to pop up, I'll I'll note that in the in uh, in North America, funders are are interested in research that examines what's going on all over the world. So it's 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 not at all the case that um, U.S. funders are uh, narrowly focused geographically, although it does op it sometimes depend on the funding vehicle. So this is again where you need to check the parameters um, for uh, for guidance about whether it, it's a fit for you, and then also how to frame what you wish to do so that it it connects well to that funding opportunity. L Nye, nice to see you, L. It's very nice to see you both too. Thank you so much for doing the workshop. I thought I might follow up on Pallavi's question. It's been really wonderful to have both of you speaking about the US and Europe. Um, but I was wondering if either of you have been following fellowship and grant opportunities in the UK, particularly post-Brexit, because that might be relevant for some people here. Yeah, as a a strong believer in the European Union, I was always upset by the fact that the UK <laughs> is allowed to participate in all the EU funding schemes, but they are. And they are actually, of all the European countries, the most successful in applying for EU grants because they have a bit of the best support structure for it. And then also being English native speakers often helps in framing arguments in a good way. So I, there's no problem with UK universities being part of larger ESC grants in collaboration with others but also UK scholars applying for Marie Curie or applying for individual person grants within the EU. That's not at all problematic. And I have noticed in the past few years post-Brexit that more and more UK scholars are also coming over to continental Europe for individual fellowships with private foundations and with uh, national research foundations, because that's typically also open to them if they relocate. So, so Within the European context, I don't think it's a problematic. I think within the UK, it's gotten a little bit tougher maybe, but uh, I'm not the expert on the UK. I only see that from like uh, conversations I have with colleagues 
So I think there there is less money available now than there was a few years ago, and people start feeling that. Um, that can change again. That's a supply and demand situation, maybe. Not so sure another mm. another question in the in the chat from uh, 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 that that raises this question about um, the informal relationships with with foundations that sometimes become very significant as a means for finding funding opportunities. Um, this apps and then the question is, well, who's in a position to be able to foster those types of relationships? Um, and I would say this is not just um, a channel that tends to be available only to scholars who've completed their PhDs. It's honestly really something that's much more feasible for uh, scholars who are prominent in some way or another. So uh, this is I, this is not something that I necessarily view as a, a best practice. It's just the reality of how things continue to operate with with some foundations. So um, that's not to say that there that this channel is completely foreclosed to early career scholars, but there it's much more likely to be open to an early career scholar who's made a splash. <laughs> um, I can tell you right now, this is not in in the realm of. of of business history, but there's a, a legal scholar at Duke who also has a grounding in philosophy who has written in an area of great interest to a number of foundations, and they are they are knocking on this person's door all the time. Uh, I'm not saying they're just throwing opportunities this person's way, but th there are there are avenues for conversation that uh, that are just not available to the average scholar. Um, there are also circumstances where people who've had a positive uh, experience with a particular funding uh, avenue at a foundation, then build a relationship with uh, the program officer, and it becomes much easier to uh, then put forward another set of ideas and get feedback on them and have a conversation about where there might be interest in funding. Uh, the question is, how do you get that, that relationship started? And I will say the funding that I had with Smith Richardson Foundation had this character, but it's not that I had the relationship. One of my one of my uh, uh, collaborators had the relationship. And why did that person have a relationship with this this program officer? Because my collaborator had been on a different project with somebody else who had a relationship with that program officer. So again, not saying this is this is best practice necessarily, but there are foundations who like to work this way. And there are also reasons for it because they want to curate a little bit more uh, in partnership with, with scholars what they fund. And they find this is a, a better way to do it. Yeah, I agree. And I think, I mean, there is actually, most foundations I think are not hostile to people calling them up and asking for advice of where the what direction the foundation is turning, what they're trying to accomplish in the next few years, and maybe having preliminary conversations. That's not that's not a best that may not be a best practice, but it isn't as unusual either. So sometimes it takes picking up the phone or kind of reaching out to people a little bit. One other thing that I find really helpful for my own career was there is a certain life cycle to fundraising. So at the very beginning, it's the hardest. And you probably want to start with smaller grants and easier access foundations like the BHC and then build up towards the larger grants because every bit of track record that you have makes it a bit easier for the next step at, of the ladder. And that includes, of course, building longer term relationships with specific foundations. But even beyond that is also showing a track record of having these kind of projects and then building towards size. I think that is helpful and in many places even institutionalized where you get a bit of seed funding from your university and then build up towards a larger grant application. But Chris had um, another question, I think. Yeah, uh, before we go to Chris, just oh. clarifying some of the questions that have come through in the chat. What, what I'm describing here is a, the way that um, some foundations get interested in work that's going on by scholars. And actually, it's not the scholar looking to the foundation, it's the foundation looking to the scholar. And that's, that's typically not about, say, a fellowship. That would be, tell us what you're working on what your next area is we might we might be able to give you grant funding for that that would support not just the individual but also a team um that's not the kind of thing that that you can just look for it's the kind of thing that finds you 
Uh, and it's just it's part of the landscape for grants, but it's 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 not one that's really available to people who haven't already established prominence in an area, unfortunately. Chris. Thanks so much, uh, both of you. Sorry for the lack of video. I hope you can hear me OK. Um, my question is um, basically how do grant giving institutions value different research outputs, especially maybe where a second book as sort of this gold standard, I guess, isn't a realistic promise, so say in sort of shorter grants or anything like that. And maybe in the spirit of the BHC theme, um, do public history-like outputs have any kind of appeal? Thank you. So, so here, I think it's important really to distinguish between fellowships, which are targeting individual applicants, and grants, which presuppose teams. Uh, there are grants for which the intended output is a book of some kind, whether an edited book or uh, even sometimes uh, one type of output, which might be a sole authored book by a person in the grant team. But I would say uh, the larger the funding, the bigger the team, the more public outputs are expected as part of the equation or even the the main expectation uh, for, for what you're asking for uh, grant funding for. Um, so um, again, it often depends on the channel that you're working through. So there are, there are grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, for example, that are explicitly about public scholarship. And so there, if you were only proposing um, uh, peer-reviewed articles and peer-reviewed books for which the out the, the audience would be predominantly scholars, you would not fare very well in that competition. Uh, on the other hand, if you were talking about developing museum exhibits or uh, websites or publicly available archives, an oral history archive or something like that, you would be very much in the mix given the parameters that have been set for that 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 grant channel. So um, it is, this circles back to this question of parameters. What are what is the funder looking for? Usually they're pretty clear about it. And that that enables you to figure out and discern whether it's a good uh, fit for your where you are in your career and what you are trying to achieve. Yeah, I agree with that. And Chris, that's an excellent question. I think you're absolutely right that writing the second book entirely on a grant, on a grant is not realistic, given the many parameters and expectations that the grant givers have as well. So I think it's better to think about it either towards the end of a book project or maybe after having finished uh, an initial manuscript. I did find that the foundations the last couple of years put a lot more emphasis on public outreach dissemination, and that also includes education. And I think one element of that needs to be in a grant if it includes more than just you. So if there's other people involved, then there's often, a, I mean, is that be that a podcast or be that an educational outlet or some sort of other uh, contribution. What I, what was new to me when we applied for the Carlsberg grant right now is how much they were interested in social media presence. And that was not something that I had had five years ago or even three years ago. So much more emphasis on like bringing in a professional social media editor and helping with like really letting the research results shine so that people can notice them. So I think that's that's an interesting development and there's maybe more that can be done around that. The Carlsberg Foundation also encouraged us to make a movie together with our movie school, which I also thought was an interesting outlet for academic research that I have never thought about before. But there was clearly a strong interest and that might be partly because it's a private foundation that's very interested in its image uh, to kind of look for these new channels to make the research results shine. But I would think in any grant application, it's a good idea to think about like, what are we doing with the research results? How are they gonna contribute to society and to the academic community, both of those, right? And that's a, that's a good line of thought to develop in a grant like that. So another another question in the chat, Christina, about um, the advantage of having good community partners and support from local institutions as well as faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, in Does that help a, a, a application for a fellowship? As with so many of the questions that we've received, the answer is, it depends. Um, if you're applying for the American Council of Learned Societies postdoc uh, fellowship that now exists around public scholarship, 
and that is looking both uh, to support people who are on a really compelling intellectual trajectory. They're asking really interesting academic questions that also have some interdisciplinary appeal. And on top of that, involve community engagement and some degree of public uh, uh, scholarship. That is to say, not just outputs that are imagining uh, scholarly readers, but also potentially broader uh, publics, whether those are uh, readers or listeners or viewers, then what you've described is not just helpful, it's actually essential. And I, I say that as somebody who actually is a peer reviewer for those for that American Council of Learned Societies postdoc that's been running for the last couple of years. Um, so it, you know, if that's the type of competition, absolutely. If the nature, if it's a more traditional fellowship, and again, here we're talking about fellowships, not grants. So fellowships that support one person to do a, an intellectual project. Um, if, if the nature of the questions you're asking lend themselves to community engagement, and here I don't just mean community-based, like you're doing field work or you're, you're engaged in oral history interviews in the field, but that you are actually involving community partners in the whole a uh, cycle of research from developing the questions to carrying out the research and then to thinking about how to disseminate it, then absolutely demonstrating those partnerships is essential. If you're doing a more traditional archival research project, those might be less relevant. And they might actually send a signal that, and it, it, for the for a particular kind of grant app, uh, or sorry, fellowship competition, they might send a signal that would not be helpful to you. One thing maybe to add to that, it's not directly partnerships related, but I think most grant givers appreciate some sort of advisory board, even if it's just a single person or one or two people that are generally supporting you on your journey. And it's worthwhile considering that, especially since we have a huge advantage when it comes to advisory boards, because the business history community is relatively small and relatively tight. So I don't think there would be many members of the BHC that would say no if you made such an ask towards them, right? I mean, so I think that's an opportunity to show strong links into the international academic community, which I imagine would be helpful and supportive in that way. And then even if you get rejected for the grant, at least you build a relationship that you can use afterwards. That's also nice. So so Christina, there's a there are a couple of questions in the in the chat that I'm gonna bundle for you. Yeah. Um both of which are really about how do you find the opportunities? What what is the good strategy? You mentioned this a little bit earlier, so that's why I'm uh, maybe if you could elaborate on on that, if if you want to, if you just want to get a sense of where the opportunities are, um, how do you how do you look? Where yeah. where where are their compilations? What what's a strategy for for it's keeping very abreast? few very very few compilations? And it's important to know that all of this is essentially a networking game, right? I mean, you learn more about opportunities the more you are tuned in to the community, the more you engage with people, the more you show up voluntarily to events, come to mentoring week at the BHC, come to online seminars that Harvard is doing uh, all the time, like show your face and come to conferences. Those, That's basically where the unofficial communication around these things happen, right? I mentioned a few people that try and bring things together. And I say it again, the, the BHC, the EBHA have regular information newsletters. I think HNET is very useful that way. I do think LinkedIn is becoming more and more important. And there's a couple of hashtags around business history that can, you know, bring things together a little bit. Paula de la Cruz, a social media editor for many of the journals in our field, has tried to become a place of compilation. But really, it is a matter of getting to know people. And so I will say that I think a good, uh, good idea is to let people know if you are interested in this, because the more people know that you are searching, the more your name comes up. And the more people might actually forward you opportunities. It takes me very little to forward a job opening or a fellowship idea, an opportunity to a colleague if I know they're looking for it, but I wouldn't necessarily do it for a ton of people around me, right? I mean, so that, that's really then a matter of signaling. And I think the BHC can be quite helpful in that way. So, so um, a lot of the questions, and I think a lot of the participants today are uh, in the position of being fairly early at the early career stage. So we have a number of uh, uh, graduate students. We have uh, some people who have postdocs. Uh, one, one thing under your control, I'm just gonna amplify something that Christina said, because uh, it's so important, is not just to let 
uh, to, to network and to let people in general know your area of interest, but also uh, to engage with your graduate mentors about this specifically. If they're doing their job appropriately, when something comes across their screen, they're thinking all the time, well, oh, that could be good for X or Y or Z, and then they pass it along. Because there is no, unfortunately, there is no Uber uh, listserv that you can count on to uh, drop something uh, in your in your email 